French commandos at Port Fouad, east of the Suez Canal, proceeds as a jet bombing just about paralyzes the Egyptian defenses. And scenes reminiscent of many Allied invasions during World War II are enacted in strength for the first time since the end of that conflict. Hardly any Egyptian resistance is met, and the French are soon in the city, rounding up the remnants of Colonel Nasser's army that failed to... But sunken ships dotting the canal make the value of the action questionable. Doubly so now that it halts here. France with Britain agreeing to a ceasefire at the request of the United Nations. Said, the major city on the west bank of the Suez, the British had a real tough time. They ran into heavy fire and had to fight desperately to achieve their objective and maintain the time schedule as agreed upon with their French allies. Evidence of the fury of the battle is everywhere throughout this great port, one of the world's most vital shipping centers. Colonel Nasser's agreement to allow a United Nations police force to patrol the Suez came too late to prevent this desolation. Capodicino Airport, Naples, the word of Nasser's agreement to the UN police force starts the first contingent Suezward. It's a unit from Denmark and will be transported to its Egyptian patrol post by US Globemasters. Arriving from the west to avoid frontal attacks on densely populated areas, Israeli forces from the Sinai Desert occupy the troubled Gaza Strip taking early precautions that keep to a minimum incidents that could provoke bloodshed. A peaceful occupation that allows the native populace maximum freedom. Later, after a flight on a reconnaissance plane over the Sinai Peninsula, Movitone News visits with the Israeli troops, which defeated the Egyptians in this desert no man's land. Considered an act of self-preservation, the expedition results in the fall of the Egyptian fortress at Sharem el Sheikh which was firing on shipping bound for Israel. It yields thousands of prisoners to the victorious forces, with $40 million worth of battle equipment which Cairo recently received from Soviet Russia. Rating cheers for General Moshe Dayan, Israeli Commander-in-Chief. Sitting in Jerusalem, the Israeli parliament upholds Premier Ben-Gurion's decision to withdraw from the Sinai Peninsula. His country's objectives attained, the Premier by his action obeys the UN and proves Israel is not seeking to expand territorially. But $40 million worth of captured equipment, most of it recently supplied by Russia, proves to Israel's satisfaction that Colonel Nasser, spurred by the Kremlin, was considering aggressive action from the Sinai Peninsula. What other reason, the Israeli ask, could Cairo have for maintaining this vast war potential in a desert, except to provide its suicidal fatayeens with the wherewithal for their raids? A vast prize to a lightning strike that upsets the communist timetable. As shortages follow the disruption caused by the Anglo-French action around the Suez Canal, the city of Port Said has to resort to bread rationing. The British, after taking the city following a two-day struggle, are pulling out. But food shipments to the port have dwindled, which makes getting home with your bread allotment precarious. As bands of hungry youngsters roam the streets and set upon lone wayfarers who happen to be carrying provisions. Port Said's police fled with the Egyptian army. The area is at the mercy of these young ones with appetites. The harbor of Port Said, which is the canal's major seaport on the West Bank, is revealed as a graveyard of sunken ships. A gesture by the Egyptians to thwart the main objective of the Anglo-French invasion, which was to keep the vital waterway open. But with the fighting all over, the canal is blocked and may continue so for months. Meanwhile, in another part of Port Said, the British troops who took the city only a few days ago are being withdrawn. An action complying with the United Nations Assembly's decision. The Tommies are being returned to Cyprus from where the assault on the Suez was launched. 
All of which brings Canada's General Burns, who will command the United Nations Suez Police on an inspection tour of the area to be patrolled. Starting from Abu Suwer on the west of the canal near Ismailia. A force for peace. The first unit to land behind the Egyptian lines is brought in by Swiss airplanes chartered by the United Nations. Outside Port Said, members of the United Nations Ceasefire Observation Party prepare for a tour between the front lines of the opposing forces at the Suez Canal. Nine white-painted jeep station wagons carry the observers who make their inspection over the narrow canal causeway, where separated only by 250 yards, the Anglo, French, and Egyptian armies face each other. Meanwhile, the canal's big West Bank city, Port Said, which was captured by the British, takes advantage of the ceasefire to go about business as usual, its citizens fraternizing with the invaders, who are careful to avoid trouble. In the sidewalk cafes, the men enjoy the normal nip, and on the streets, gossiping women the everyday quip, and a roving still photographer, a snap. A triumph for the United Nations that sees peace instead of panic. Meanwhile, troubled by the general Middle East situation, the leaders of nine Arab states assemble at Beirut, Lebanon, to discuss problems they share in common. Described as the most significant party ever held by the Arab League, Three kings and two presidents are in attendance, though President Nasser of Egypt is conspicuously absent to be represented by his ambassador here. The talks, it is said, will be aimed at keeping the Soviets out of the Middle East while defending Arab rights in the West. Riding through Port Said, the United Nations police force for the Suez Canal is given a rousing welcome by the citizens of the West Bank City. It's a spontaneous demonstration, but British troops are forced to clear the way for the peace patrol when communist agitators in the crowd try to provoke the Egyptians into an unfriendly attitude. But the people refuse to be deluded and recognize the force for what it is. And the United Nations patrol for peace at the vital waterway becomes an historic fact. The patrol action of the United Nations will mean the quick release of these thousands of Egyptian prisoners held somewhere in Israel. They were captured by Israeli forces in the battles of the Sinai Desert. When deserted by their officers, they surrendered with $40 million worth of arms supplied by Russia and Czechoslovakia. Described as suicidal Fedayeen commandos, they look anything but in the humility of their imprisonment. Meanwhile, throughout Western Europe, as here in Paris, the shortage of gas caused by the sabotaging of the Suez recalls the fuel famines of World War II, a situation that will continue until the United Nations patrol makes possible the removal of the sunken ships that now block the international waterway. Today, the shortage in France is so acute, the government issued orders that the petrol on hand be reserved for doctors and nurses, etc., etc. From Port Said at the Suez Canal, your movie tone news camera catches a British man of war proceeding through the waterway. The first ship of any kind to move over the canal since the crisis precipitated by the Anglo French Israeli invasion of Egypt. Another achievement of the United Nations Emergency Force, headed by Canada's General Burns, shown here at Port Said with General Cately, commander of the British forces in the area. General Burns is in Egypt to set up headquarters at the ceasefire line between the Anglo-French and Egyptian forces, an action that coincides with the departure of British troops from the city on the Suez. A praiseworthy British gesture in deference to the United Nations and in the cause of peace. For the British lost many Tommies to the fierce Egyptian opposition they encountered taking the port.